Hi guys, great to have you with us again on another episode of Book Insights from Memode. I'm Tom Butler Bowden. Every week, what we do is a deep dive into a non-fiction bestseller. Some of the books we're covering are recent hits and others are ancient classics. The main thing is that every book can improve your life or your work in some way, or just make you think. So today's book insight, we're gonna change gear a bit and delve into mental illness with a psychology classic called An Unquiet Mind by K. Redfield Jamison. We can study manic depression or bipolar disorder as much as we like, but the best understanding of it comes from someone who's actually lived with it. Obviously, it's impossible to really know what it's like, but you do get a sense of it from this book. The surprising thing I took away from it is that the euphoria that comes with manic phases can be addictive. Your doctor or your family can tell you to take the medication to blunt the edges, but maybe you just don't want to, even if you know that the depression that follows is horrific. The scenes in the book where Jamison describes her manic phases are pretty gripping. Like the best non-fiction, it reads like a novel, and once I started it, I found it hard to put down. For all her suffering, Jamison never regrets having had bipolar. It's part of who she is, and she knows how it can run in families. Her father had it, and her other book, Touch With Fire, shows how it can run in artistic or high-achieving families. The amazing thing is that Jamison has been both a patient getting treatment for the disorder and an academic studying. She wrote a key textbook on bipolar and has also made contributions to the study of suicide and society's responses to it. Today, she's a professor in mood disorders and psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Hope you enjoy it. Please leave comments or rate the book insight. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on the platform you're listening on. That way you'll get a notification of a new episode each week. If you'd like 24-7 unlimited access to our library of over 100 book insights, you can do that. Just go to memo.com forward slash insights you'll see the link posted on the podcast description. Okay, let's get into An Unquiet Mind, a memoir of moods and madness. When Kay Redfield Jameson was in her third year of elementary school, she witnessed a scene she'd never forget. It's recess, and Jameson and her classmates are out in the playground, The noise of a jet engine roars above them, and Jameson looks up, waving. Her father is a pilot, and she's inherited his fascination for the skies. But something isn't right. The noise of the engine keeps growing louder and louder, the plane drawing closer and closer. Much too close, in fact. It narrowly avoids the children before flying into some trees just outside the playground and exploding in front of their eyes. For her... The sky's beauty and vastness are now forever tinged with death. With this scene, Jameson opens the first chapter of An Unquiet Mind, a memoir of moods and madness. The duality of her newfound perspective on the skies is a metaphor for her life to come. Mania and depression, resistance and acceptance, life and death. These themes flow through the book, giving us a window into what it's like to live with manic depression. If Jameson's book was just about her research into bipolar disorder, it would have been an interesting read. What makes it a gripping read is that the supposedly objective researcher suffers from the condition herself. Jameson goes to great lengths to hide the fact from her peers and superiors. An Unquiet Mind is first and foremost a first-hand account of what it's like to live with manic depression, the incredible highs and the devastating lows which bring her close to suicide. In this book, Insight, we'll explore Jameson's account of her experiences in three parts. Defining manic depression. What actually is mania? What is depression? A battle with lithium. Jameson's complex relationship with the medication she's prescribed. Why she resists taking it, the costs, and her ultimate reconciliation with lithium as a mood stabilizer. The others. The response that her illness elicits in others from friends to lovers to colleagues. Before we start, let's make a brief note on terminology. 
The current accepted medical term for manic depression is bipolar disorder. Jameson favors manic depression as a more accurate, less stigmatizing description of her experiences and uses it throughout her book. We'll follow her use of the term. Ask anybody to define manic depression and they'll probably tell you it's an illness involving alternating bouts of low and high mood. While this is true to some extent, Jameson tells us that it's an incomplete picture. It's certainly the case that mania can involve unusually high mood, but this isn't necessarily so. It can also involve a persistently irritable mood. Episodes of mania also bring changes in thinking and behavior. Here's Jameson talking with the DNA Learning Center about the symptoms of mania. Well, mania is just like depression is, um, is different in different people. It can range from very mild periods of just feeling elated and full of energy and not needing much sleep to a full-blown psychosis where people hallucinate, see things that aren't there, hear things that aren't there. During a manic episode, you might experience racing thoughts, less need for sleep, an exaggerated sense of self-worth, an increased propensity for risk-taking, uninhibited spending, and sexual adventuring. For some individuals, as for Jameson, mania can be accompanied by psychosis involving hallucinations or delusional beliefs. As for depression, this isn't just a case of feeling sad or upset or enduring a prolonged period of black mood or a loss of interest or pleasure. It also brings with it cognitive and behavioral changes, including reduced concentration, an excessive sense of guilt, loss of energy, and, as in Jameson's case, recurrent thoughts of death and suicide. Somewhat counterintuitively, it's possible for individuals with manic depression to experience so-called mixed states, in which symptoms of both mania and depression occur simultaneously. For example, you might have an exaggerated sense of self-worth at the same time as experiencing a deep sense of guilt, these mixed states of depression and mania pose a particularly high risk of suicide. In 1949, a little-known Australian medical journal published an article by psychiatrist John Cade. The subject was on the therapeutic effects of lithium carbonate in acute mania. Just over 20 years later, in 1970, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration finally approved the use of lithium as a mood stabilizer, it became the key medication in the treatment of manic depression and proved crucial in saving lives. Yet for Jameson, the path to lithium is a difficult and protracted one. Let's take a look at why. It takes a long time for Jameson to understand and admit that she has a mental illness and to seek psychiatric help. While studying clinical psychology, she doesn't make a connection between her own experiences and the illness referred to as manic depression in her reading. Even as a practicing psychologist, she refuses to accept that she has an illness. This might seem baffling, but she gives us some reasons. First, there's the fact that manic depression, by its nature, involves changes and fluctuations in something that's in flux even when we're mentally healthy, namely our mood. For Jameson, who's prone to dramatic shifts in mood from early childhood, her manic depressive episodes seem normal to her. She writes that her manias seem at first simply to be an extension of herself. Then there's the issue of self-perception. Behaviors that might cause us to suspect mental illness in others might not ring any alarm bells when we're the ones experiencing them. This skewed self-perception is neatly illustrated in Jameson's account of a garden party. She attends the garden party when she becomes a new member of the faculty at UCLA. By coincidence, Jameson's future psychiatrist is also present. When they later compare their recollections of Jameson's behavior at the party, they find these differ greatly. She remembers being perhaps a bit high, but having a fabulous, bubbly, seductive, assured time, talking to countless people and feeling irresistibly charming. Her psychiatrist-to-be, on the other hand, remembers her as frenetic and far too talkative. Jameson recalls feeling and looking splendid, he recalls someone in a manic state. Then there's the pace at which her illness progresses. She does not, as she puts it, wake up one day to find myself mad. The passage into her first full-blown episode of mania is a slow one, spanning a course of months. 
In this time, her thoughts gradually become faster and more frenzied. And small, incremental shifts are usually harder to notice than abrupt changes. In her late 20s, during an episode of Mania, the man Jameson is dating tells her he thinks she's mentally unwell and persuades her to make an appointment with a psychiatrist. After an initial assessment, the psychiatrist diagnoses Jameson and recommends medication. Although part of her is resentful of her diagnosis, she's also relieved by it. Shortly afterwards, she starts to take lithium. One might expect that once the lithium starts to take effect, the worst of Jameson's battle with manic depression is behind her. But it's only the beginning. We'll have to pause for now in Jameson's account of living with manic depression. But before we go, let's catch up with what we've learned so far. We're looking at Jameson's book, An Unquiet Mind. First, we've gone over some of the realities of manic depression. Neither mania nor depression are easy to categorize. Manic depression, likewise, is even more difficult to identify since its growth is incremental and the sufferer won't notice the changes coming over them. We've also covered the early stages of Jameson's journey identifying that something isn't right with her. We'll continue next time as her relationship with the drug lithium progresses. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our exploration into Kay Redfield Jameson's book. It's called An Unquiet Mind, a memoir of moods and madness. We've learned so far that it's difficult to identify the symptoms of mania or depression within yourself. Here's Jameson talking to the DNA Learning Center. I think it's very hard for people who haven't been depressed or haven't been manic to really get a sense of what it's like to experience these illnesses. It's, uh, it's qualitatively different. It's not just quantitatively different from depression, the kind of the ordinary blues of life. Previously, we've gone over how Jameson identified she had a problem. Her psychiatrist helped her understand how her perception of her own behavior was flawed. We'll continue now with Jameson's adventures with the drug lithium. Six months after Jameson starts taking lithium, she discontinues it against medical advice. She soon experiences another episode of mania followed by a severe depression. This marks the beginning of a cycle of stopping and resuming her medication. What lies behind the strange reluctance to take lithium consistently? For one, the very effectiveness of the drug leads her, in an ironic twist, to discontinue it. Once she has started taking it and starts to feel well again, she finds it easy to convince herself that she's cured for good, that her manic depression will not come back, despite being aware of the scientific evidence to the contrary. Jameson's upbringing also plays a crucial role in her resistance to lithium. In the military world in which she was raised, great value is placed on self-control and the ability to handle whatever life throws your way. Despite her diagnosis of mental illness, Jameson believes that she should be capable of dealing with her difficulties without having to rely upon crutches such as medication. Then there are the side effects from the high dose of lithium she's initially prescribed. During her first 10 years on the medication, Jameson suffers from severe nausea, frequent vomiting, and loss of coordination. Previously an accomplished athlete, she finds herself moving clumsily. She's forced to give up the horse riding she once enjoyed. Worse, lithium also has a severe impact on her reading skills, impairing her ability to concentrate on and understand written text. She describes trying to retain what she's read only for it to fade from her mind, like snow on a hot pavement. In an attempt to retain a connection to literature, she takes to reading children's stories. For someone whose livelihood and passions rely heavily on the written word and who is used to their mind being their best friend, this is a difficult loss to bear. Yet there's an even greater sacrifice that comes with being on lithium, the loss of mania. It's Jameson's early, less severe episodes of mania that hold a particularly powerful attraction. She writes, when you're high, it's tremendous. 
The ideas and feelings are fast and frequent, like shooting stars, and you follow them until you find better and brighter ones. Shyness goes. The right words and gestures are suddenly there. The power to captivate others feel like a certainty. Feelings of ease, intensity, power, well-being, financial omnipotence, and euphoria pervade one's marrow. Given the feelings of euphoria they bring on, the manic episodes become addictive. And yet, Jameson's attitude towards lithium does eventually shift. In spite of this, she feels she's giving up. She starts taking her medication regularly and continues to do so for the decades to come. The main reason is that her manic episodes have deeply troubling consequences. Lithium may impact her ability to read and retain information, but her most severe episodes of mania disrupt her capacity for meaningful thought altogether. She recounts trailing off halfway through sentences, having forgotten what she was trying to say, the fragments of ideas and images frenziedly racing through her mind. Then there's the issue of overspending. During her manic episodes, Jameson pays out huge amounts of money in impulsive shopping sprees, her mania renders her insensible to the debts and embarrassment that she will struggle with once the episode is passed. She recounts one shopping spree in London where she spends several hundred pounds on books having titles or covers that somehow caught her fancy. Books on the natural history of the mole. Twenty penguin books because she thought it could be nice if the penguins could form a colony. This impulsiveness and lack of self-control extends to other behaviors. During her manic episodes... Jameson can be physically violent towards herself and others, which is distressing and frightening for everyone involved. And then there's the depression, the inescapable twin of episodes of mania. She describes the catastrophic aftermath of her initial resistance to taking medication as psychotic mania, followed, inevitably, by a long and lacerating black suicidal depression. In response to one particular depressive episode, Jameson resumes taking lithium, but it's too little too late. In the grips of her depression, she decides to end her life. She takes a massive overdose of lithium and waits to die. On the evening of her overdose, her brother rings to check in on her. He hears from her voice that something's wrong and calls for help. In the dark months that follow, she finally commits to taking lithium on a regular basis. The result is that her life becomes a much stabler and more predictable place than she ever imagined. She eventually moves to a lower dose that means lighter side effects. She can enjoy reading science and literature again, as well as regaining some of the lost intensity of her sensory and emotional experience, previously flattened by medication. It's a combination of lithium and psychotherapy, rather than lithium alone, which Jameson credits with allowing her to lead a normal life. While lithium prevents her mania and depression, it is psychotherapy that allows her the space to make sense of her experiences, to hope, and to heal. The struggle to reconcile oneself with taking lithium is played out in the lives of tens of thousands of individuals every year, Jameson notes. In some cases, it has a fatal ending. For her, however, lithium is the drug that almost kills her but ultimately saves her life. Let's take a break for now, but before we go, we'll recap what we've covered. We're looking at An Unquiet Mind by K. Redfield Jameson. This time, we've looked at a brief history of Jameson's path to consistently taking the drug lithium. Although it balanced her moods, the drug's side effects persuaded her to drop the medication. After a particularly dark period of her life, she started taking the medication permanently deciding that being on the pills was better than being off. Next, we'll look at how Jameson's unstable moods and behaviors affect others around her. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our discussion on Kay Redfield Jameson's book on manic depression. It's called An Unquiet Mind, 
a memoir of moods and madness. Previously, we've gone over Jameson's sticky history with taking lithium and why keeping up with the drug was a challenge. Now we'll look at how Jameson's relationships were affected by her illness. Then we'll end with a look at the book's legacy. No account of what it's like to live with manic depression would be complete without the interpersonal context. How does having manic depression impact those around you? How do they respond? Here's Jameson talking with Welcome Nation. It's underappreciated how devastating these illnesses are to families and to colleagues and friends. There are no easy ways of dealing with these things. If there were, they would have been figured out. For Jameson, even the apparently simple act of telling another person that she has manic depression is fraught with worry. Will the information be met with acceptance, or will she face resistance and contempt? Bitter experience has taught her not to assume the former. She describes what happens when, after a period of growing friendship, she decides to tell a colleague about her illness. Despite being a psychoanalyst and therefore presumably accustomed to encountering others' distress, the colleague starts to cry. His tears are not, it transpires, tears of compassion. It turns out he's deeply disappointed to discover the truth about a person he had previously believed to be so strong. Jameson instantly divines his thinking. He was normal. She was not. There are also those people who believe they have the right to make judgments about the life choices of people with mental illness. Take, for example, the doctor who tells Jameson, completely unsolicited, that as a manic depressive, she should never have children. Then there's Jameson's own sister, who vilifies her for taking medication to control her illness, accusing her of drugging away her feelings and destroying her personality. Yet alongside the unkind reactions to Jameson's illness are also countless examples of compassion and support. There's the friend who, following Jameson's suicide attempt, spends evening after evening with her, meeting her for 2 a.m. ice cream trips when he knows she needs the company. Then there's the colleague who, finding Jameson asleep at her desk during a period of depression, places a coat over her and writes a message of encouragement for when she wakes. Family members also support Jameson in coping with life with manic depression, not only at an emotional, but also at a practical level. Her brother helps manage the financial consequences of her mania-induced spending sprees, sorting through stacks of receipts and overdraft notices and arranging a loan for the repayment of her debts, all without passing a word of judgment. Her mother bolsters her with cooked meals, fresh laundry, and drives to the doctor and pharmacist. Support with these mundane, seemingly trivial tasks is one of the protective factors that keeps Jameson going and stay alive. How did Jameson's romantic partners respond to her manic depression? In the three relationships she writes about in some depth, her disclosure of her illness is met with kindness. Rather than ending their relationship, her partners seek to understand the impact of her illness and how they can best support her. One of the men, an army psychiatrist with whom Jameson enjoys an intense romance until his sudden death at the age of 44, arranges dinner invitations at the homes of two senior army officers with manic depression in a bid to show her the possibility of leading a normal life in spite of her illness. Several years later, the subsequent partner supports her in reducing her dose of lithium, which finally restores Jameson's ability to read. It isn't all plain sailing in love. Jameson's first full-blown episode of mania triggers her to leave her then-husband in search of greater freedom and excitement. Although the couple try to repair the relationship, they eventually concede defeat. Even after she starts taking lithium, Jameson's manias and depressions don't disappear completely, and she writes openly about the strains it places on her relationship with her second husband. The anger and depression that at times accompany her manias can be frightening and confusing. What message can we take from Jameson's account of how people respond to her illness? Even when others respond to manic depression with support and understanding, which is not always the case, the burden the illness places on relationships is heavy. In spite of this, some relationships can and do endure. Jameson learns to replace the buzz of intoxicating affairs with the normal pleasures of steady relationships. 
She notes that although she began writing her book as a personal study of manic depression, the subject matter ends up being love in all its dimensions. The hope of improving public awareness of manic depression and its complexities was one of the things that inspired Jameson to write An Unquiet Mind. The decades following its 1995 release have seen a boom in the publication of memoirs from bipolar sufferers, including British author and presenter Stephen Fry and actress Carrie Fisher. There's also Catherine Graham's book, Personal History, which tells of her husband's battle with the disorder and subsequent suicide. Has the increasing popularity of manic depression as memoir subject matter resulted in good public understanding? If only it were that simple. In a 2014 public survey conducted by the mental health charity Rethink, one in five respondents thought that people with bipolar disorder have a split personality, while more than one in ten thought the condition was another name for mood swings. In two public surveys released in 2005, only 64% of respondents could correctly identify bipolar disorder from a list of descriptions of different mental illnesses. It wasn't until the mid-20th century that psychiatry recognized manic depression as a mental illness in its own right, distinct from schizophrenia and depression. The fact that several decades later, almost two-thirds of people were able to correctly identify manic depression indicates how widespread public awareness of the illness has become. Jameson's aim in writing about manic depression isn't, however, simply to raise awareness, but to reduce discrimination. She hopes that it and other psychiatric illnesses will one day achieve consistency with other medical conditions and national health care systems. One of the flaws of An Unquiet Mind is Jameson's incomplete characterization of the causes of the illness. She describes manic depression as a genetic disease and makes reference to the genes responsible for manic depressive illness. In fact, the exact causes of bipolar disorder are unknown, and at any rate, play only a minor role in Jameson's memoir. An Unquiet Mind is, most of all, an account of a life and how its course is altered, and also unaltered, by mental illness. There's also the unique insights that her disorder gave her as a professional. In much of the memoir, Jameson records her fear at being found out as a psychologist treating manic depressives who has the condition herself. By the end of the book, her view is shifted the other way. It's the people who have lived with manic depression who are best placed to treat others. As her faculty head at UCLA tells her, if we got rid of all the manic depressives on the medical school faculty, not only would we have a much smaller faculty, it would be a far more boring one. We're concluding our discussion on An Unquiet Mind by Kay Redfield Jameson. Before we go, let's go over everything we've learned. First, we explored what is meant by the term manic depression and the fact that it is more complex than it seems. Second, we focused on Jameson's initial diagnosis and her subsequent battle with lithium. We explored why, despite her undergraduate and postgraduate studies in psychology, it took Jameson 10 years to realize she had manic depression and then why it took her so long to reconcile her with taking medication. Finally, we looked at the ways in which people responded to Jameson's manic depression. We saw that even those who might be expected to respond with understanding don't always do so. Yet we also witnessed some of the many acts of kindness and love shown to Jameson during periods of struggle. Jameson's great contribution is to have helped bridge the gap between the world of the normal and the mad, Though it's no longer politically correct to use the term mad, she's against banning its use entirely, as it's only by truly understanding mania and psychosis, and calling it for what it is, that we can ever treat it properly. Here's Jameson again on Welcome Nation to close us out. The science is moving unbelievably rapidly and beautifully and elegantly. Um, public attitudes are changing, however, glacially. So yes, it's hard, but Yes, it's interesting.
Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.